Welcome to the Ethics Village. Um, if you notice, there were cards on your seat. Everybody's got a card. What do you think this is for? Voting. So we're interactive at the Ethics Village. So we would like and encourage the speaker to ask you questions. And he's gonna, he may ask, ask or pose an ethical question. And so what we're gonna do is we'll flash up ethical if we think this is ethical, or we'll turn around and flash unethical, and this will give the speaker an idea about the consensus in the audience. So, uh, with that being said, I met Renderman a lot longer than we both can to admit at this point. I can remember. We've had a very uh, friendly, adversarial, war-driving relationship over the years. We participate in a lot of the same contests. I soundly beat him in those contests, <laughs> and uh, but it was a friendly, it was a friendly thing, and in the spirit of camaraderie, and I, we contacted Render Man because I think he was on the responsible disclosure panel at the Ethics Village with us last year, and he did um, as good a job as you can with the panel that we had. You did great. And yeah, I so I played the night before while I was drunk. So. so Hey, yeah, that's the best thing that you do. You get them drunk and then see what happens. I'll read any of them. So you did a great job, and I think that uh, the most appropriate person to start the conversation as we discuss policy today at the Ethics Village is a nice rant on disclosure from Render Man. So I'll let you introduce yourself. But again, thank you very much, man. Thank you. Oh, and I'm Big Easy. I'm from DC 217, along with all the other folks that we're hosting the village today. Thank you. Yes. All right. Good morning. Uh, just so you know why uh, we have this, this rivalry, there was one war driving contest where they split Vegas down the strip. And it was uh, first day was war driving uh, everything east of the strip. And the second day was doing everything west. You drove to what? Santa Monica? Um, Malibu. <laughs> Malibu. And collected data there because you got more points for unique access points. So he drove three hours up to Malibu. Wait, no, that's not the whole story. So uh, uh, <laughs> hang on a second. Hey, so um, what happened was we were, it was Friday night and we were getting ready to go to Hacker Jeopardy. It was, it was midnight. And um, we had a team meeting because we had already war driven the entire town. We had spent 50 hours war driving the entire town. We knew where to go and we were looking at our map. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, you know, LA is west of, of Paradise. <laughs> and then one of the members of our team, Mentat, said, oh, that would be unethical. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, this is a hacker conference and it's not in the rules. So we voted, and it was three to one for going to LA. But since one of the, our members descended, we decided not to do it. But as a good hacker, we were walking out to Hacker Jeopardy at midnight, and I saw Romer, who runs the contest. And I took the opportunity to go to him and say, hey man, I have a question. I said, hypothetically. <laughs> I, said, I said, Los Angeles is west of paradise. And he looks at me, and he goes, you motherfucker. <laughs> so I'd like to ask the first ethical or unethical question. So if it's not specifically in the rules, like the description said, was that ethical or unethical behavior? That is actually codified DEF CON rule, uh, like contest rule now. It's, if it's not expressly forbidden, it's allowed. So, so you know, Render Man has a two hour slot because we'd like to have a discussion along the way. I saw some folks, I saw some black cards. I'd like to understand from somebody in the audience if they're willing to say anything, why they think that was unethical. And if you don't want to say anything, that's perfectly fine. So at the time, I got really pissed because they beat us in the, the contest and we had put a shitload of work in as well. Um, and so I'm like, oh, it gets the spirit of the contest and everything like that. But it's funny how you add a bunch of years and, uh, uh, you know, cynicism. And you realize that, as you said, this is a hacker conference. Finding ways to do things that nobody else expects 
that's what we do. My general rule now is I never participate in a contest I can't cheat at. <laughs> it's, not, it's not cheating. At B-Sides, just on, on Wednesday, I am the first person to have been disqualified from a Hacker Pyramid uh, in their 11 year history. I am very proud of this, actually. <laughs> Because I cheated so blatantly. <laughs> so, but in the entire week, the best, the best thing ever was like, we saw, I saw Render Man the next morning after we had gotten back from L.A. and everything. And I said, I said well, well, we went to L.A. And he looks at me and he goes, fuck, I should have thought of that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's one of those, like, you're pissed because you didn't think of it first. Right. And it's, it was like. And a good was, idea is a good idea. compliment you could get, right? <laughs> So, well, I, I think some of the greatest compliments I gave you were the four-letter words I probably called you a lot that way of the week. Well, you know, th that's our secret phrase of love. <laughs> okay. Fuck right. you. So, <laughs> so we're, really, we're really hoping for this to be an interactive thing. We're all, we're all, yeah? What's war driving? What's war driving? So how, how old are you? <laughs> so anyway, What's it all? <laughs> there's an entire village now dedicated to war driving, it's called the Wireless Village, and um, so basically back in the day when wireless was first coming out, some folks uh, were interested in how far had wireless penetrated into consumer homes. And so as good folk, what we did, pioneering war drivers like Pete Shipley built a set of tools that basically you can run them on a laptop and then just go around and ask, do you have a wireless access point? And basically the wireless access point would answer and say, yes, I'm a wireless access point. Yeah, here's and my SSID. Here's make note stuff. Yeah. of the GPS coordinates where that was. And then there was a, uh, a database sprung up so that people could share this information. Because one of the things we began to track was whether or not people were actually encrypting their wireless network because web was... Uh, so it just became a hobby because we were interested, like from my perspective, I was uh, in charge of security in a large company and I didn't want unauthorized wireless networks in my building. So I wanted to be good at detecting these things. So I took it up as a hobby to try and get good and then I ended up getting really good at it. Yeah. Uh, close standing in the back, we've got seats all over the place here. Like, feel so, free. And then the thing is, you have to sit in a chair. The capacity of the room, according to the fire marshal, is um, one ass for every chair, and then we start a line. So we're not really allowed to let people clutter up in the back door. So come on up and have a seat. And then if there's not an ethical or unethical car in your seat, let us know. We can, we can bring you another one. We don't bite without consent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll talk about that later. There you go. All right. So, um, wow. I, I don't think I've ever had like first slot in anything uh, at DEFCON in quite a long time. So. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> That's what I do. That's what they pay me for. I fuck well, shit up. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah. Just get going, man. All right. Man. You'll do so thank you for uh, coming out this morning. Um, as mentioned, I am Renderman. Uh, this is my, you know, if you know me at all, and I've been around for 20 years here, uh, founder of the Internet of Dongs project. That is my latest thing, Donna Dongs. I'm also the Pope of the Church of Wi-Fi. And I have many other uh, hobbies, which include being a human pinata. This is my 20th DEF CON in a row. Cut me in half, count the rings, like, I don't want to know how much damage I've done to my liver over all this time. We already went over some of the stories that Easy had about uh, early war driving contests. Uh, I'm one of the founders of the, uh, the Wireless Village. Uh, other people much better than I and more organized have taken it over, but uh, started that back at the, the Riviera days. Um, DEF CON Black Badge owner, so this thing has saved me so much money over the years. <laughs> I think that was DC 12. Yeah. Um, and I'm also, uh, oddly, one of only two people that have a DEF CON leather jacket that did not win it in a contest. 
So here's an ethical question. Uh, the guys that were handling the uh, uh, order from China for the DEF CON leather jackets, which you should only be able to get winning like CTF or, or like some of the really major contests, they had they run a, a web store. They had ordered these things in for Jeff, but I guess somebody didn't get the memo uh, in the company, and they put them up on the website. I got my order in before they realized they shouldn't be selling these things, they should be sending them to Jeff. Um, apparently only two got out the door before they realized this, and mine was one of them. Uh, I've told Jeff, like, he knows he's, he's cool. With I believe when I told him that I had done this, he's like, okay, of all the people who should have one, it should be you, and the fact that you basically have one, you, you hacked one in a way, <laughs> is kind of awesome. So, um, I don't know, is that ethical to have one? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think I'm one of only two people I've identified that has competed in all of Lost's mystery challenges. Um, for those of you who don't know, Lost Boy would do a challenge that would you would sink your entire weekend into it. Uh, Mind-bending stuff. You literally did not know what you were going to be doing that weekend. You would just like hand you something and be like, now the contest has started. And you're like, it's a, pl you know, it's, it's a skull. Like, what do I do with this thing? You have no idea. You have to figure it out. And just some of the most amazing things in those contests. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Eddie the Yeti? No? He does a lot of the uh, 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 art you'll see. Like, if you look, even look at the uh, door for the uh, Village Ops, you know, the, you know, Village Ops speakers only. He's got that splattered kind of style. Um, that's him. So. Uh, I actually have a family crest designed by him for the hacker family uh, tattooed right here on my ribs because this community means a ridiculous amount to me. Um, you are all family I just haven't met yet. And hopefully I'm not related to any of you. <laughs> and as I said before, I never compete in a contest I can't cheat at because I'm wanting to find new and creative ways to do things. That's what hackers do. If you follow the rules, that gets boring. If other people want to comp you know, compete in a contest and, and do their thing, I'm not going to take that away from them. But if you see me up there, know that there's a plan in place somehow. So what I was was a senior cybersecurity analyst uh, at ATP Financial in Edmonton, Alberta, which is a provincial bank. So uh, in the States, you've got you know, state banks. Uh, this was provincial, so they were geographically limited in their customer base. Uh, internal pen tester, breaker of things, the benevolent adversary was the title I came, came up with. Uh, worked there for four and a half years, saved their butts uh, a bunch of times of stories that NDAs can't tell you. Um, a little bit about the bank, uh, created in 1938 because larger banks wouldn't serve rural areas during the Depression, so they're like, Screw you, we'll set up our own bank with blackjack and hookers. No, that's Bender. Um, it's a, a crown corporation, commercial business owned by the government. This will be relevant later. So I've done lots of stuff with disclosure, you know, using the term loosely to, hey, you've got a problem here, you know, shit's on fire, yo. Uh, trying to let people know about things. It's Big Easy mentioned war driving. It's an old map from, uh, I think, about 2002 uh, when I was mapping uh, Edmonton. This is the downtown area. And it was amazing. I remember the first time I went out war driving, I found 25 access points. It was like, oh, my God, there's so many here. <laughs> I think I have 25 in my house now. Like, powered on. Like, it, it's... Yeah, I'm definitely going to get brain cancer from that, I think. Um, but back in that day, you'd find open access points everywhere. And it was literally somebody went to Best Buy or whatever, bought this thing, plugged it in, and you know went about their business, not realizing they just invited the world you know, that could roll up to their door into their um, business network. Obviously, this is problematic. So some of them, you know, you'd be outside the business and you'd see the 
you know, the SSID, the name of the network was exactly the name of the business. So it's like, oh, that's pretty easy. So, you know, a little bit of Googling, you'd find who these, uh, uh, a contact person there and you'd, you know, make a phone call or send an email and say, hey, did you know anybody who can get in range can get onto your network? Um, a lot of people just kind of ignored me. Uh, a number of people were very thankful. Um, they hadn't considered this or they didn't realize that some employee had done this, which is still a problem. Um, got a few free lunches out of it, but that was not the cost. That was just them being nice. A um, few incredulous replies of people saying, oh, yeah, really? Like, you know, why the hell are you doing this? You know, like who's going to go driving around with a laptop? You know, open and there's you know a bunch of antennas on their roof. Like really, a um, few people got a little threatening, but you know once you actually talk to them and say no, I'm I don't want anything. I'm not extorting you or blackmailing or anything. I just want you to turn this off. But there's lots of horror stories out there of people who tried to alert people and got you know uh, uh, threatened legally and got into a lot of trouble. So I was very lucky. Um, Obviously, as wireless started proliferating, you couldn't keep up with it. It was just nuts. Uh, like I said, that first night was 25, but you know now it's like from my couch, I can see 25 different you know neighbors' networks. It's it's easy. So, so here's my first ethical question to you: How bad does a problem have to be before you have to report it? Before you feel you have to be, uh, you have to say something. Anybody want to comment on that? Like, I'm I'm genuinely looking for for inquiries. Yep. For a business or a personal? Uh, let's go with business for now. I think you got to be quicker if it's a business than maybe a person. Yep. Business is going to be more likely to be attacked than yep. random Joe on the street. Yeah, she's saying a business needs to react faster because they're more likely a target and uh, going to be attacked. Yeah, saying that uh, somebody who discovers this problem may not realize there's even larger implications at play. Yep. I would ask my uh, social networks, asking them, you know, have they worked with this company before, and do they burn people who actually are ethically? Uh, or what I uh, he's saying, you know, what's the reputation of the company? Do they burn people that report things? Um, what I've actually found is is asking. Uh, for contact information for somebody already inside, so you're not having to hit that perimeter uh, barrier of, of you know HR or sorry uh, PR or anything like that that will you know call the lawyer first, shoot, you know ask questions later. I'm actually being proactive for senior citizens who have high income wealth. That's a big problem because they don't know that they are. So that's a big problem. Yeah. So you say on a personal side, senior citizens, you know, would be an issue because they. May you know, nonprofits because they may not know. From the businesses side of you, the the question is answered by money. So if it costs less to report it than not to report it, then they report it. Well, the you're 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 saying are less than so the consequences of the catastrophe are less than the price of the mitigation. Then they do it. Yeah. Now you're actually speaking like an IT. You know, risk professional. For me, just as as a kid running around in the car with laptop and everything, finding this stuff, I just had this sense of like this this ain't right. Somebody's gonna get, you know, make somebody's gonna do something stupid, make their days, you know, somebody else's day suck. I can't sit by and not do something. So, I mean, I mean, why would one would argue that it doesn't matter about that problem to just report it anyway? Yeah. He's basically saying no, it doesn't matter how bad the problem is. It's you should report it anyways. Uh, for me, it's there's a, a gonna move on here. But uh, for me, there's a point where okay, if I report this, am I just noise? Is it's like am I just oh yeah that that's something we've got this other mitigation or something, or is it literally like you know shits on fire? You know hey did you know you, you might want to put that out. Um, and in a lot of these cases, when it's like open door access to their network, that's really bad. So, that's, so what I did about it 
was we had a lot of, of situations of people trying to report and getting into problems. Um, people doing things while we're driving that would get them into trouble, um, police or, or otherwise. So I created a stumbler ethic, uh, which is still up, strangely enough. Uh, general advice on how to comment, you know, conduct war driving, uh, create these maps, and, and not get into trouble. Things like don't connect, because that, that you're definitely crossing a legal line. Uh, but it's also respect private property, don't trespass. Um, much like hikers, uh, take only pictures, uh, leave only footprints. You know, don't don't impact these businesses or anything like that. Don't uh, you know connect to the network to try to figure out uh, who owns it or anything like that. If you just go off of the data that it gives you, you know, publicly, that's fine. Um, it worked for me, and it was something that I could point to and say, "Hey, here's how I operate." You know. Don't worry, this, you know, everybody on, in this community knows that this is the standard I hold. You know, I, as much as you want to think that I did something terrible to you, no, I didn't. I'm actually a nice person trying to report things. It's amazing how many people don't believe altruism still exists. A lot of the community adopted it. They were under no pressure. You know. um, but since then, I've generally tried to be ethical and moral about my activities. Um, varying success. I mean... Um, I do play a bad guy, you know, for a job and, and live that life in a way, but it's, I don't want to see people hurt. So, but if you fast forward 20 years, January, 2018. So I'm sitting on a show, Dan, uh, I dumped the ASN, uh, IP registration database, uh, and search for airport found 19 airports in North America. I just limited myself to North America um, and started going through their IP space on Shodan to see what I could see. The 170 odd line spreadsheet later, I'm staring at some very serious vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure. And this was because I was bored. Trying to report this stuff was hell because you've got – a lot of this stuff was like the coffee shop or the newsstand in the airport. So on the business side, not operations. If you say you've done something to you know, the air traffic control side, oh, yeah, they're going to be you know, all over that. But it's like, oh, here's the, the entire uh, point of sale system and security system for the coffee shop online and the security system has no passwords on it you can just go in and start viewing video directly that ain't good you know particularly you can start deleting things because you're logged in as admin by default like this stuff that just should not be that way um there was other things there was baggage systems there was you know VPN routers are way out of date and that had some very well-known uh, high-level vulnerabilities. And I mean, like I fly a lot to, you know, these, these kind of events and other things. And it's like, my ass is on those planes going through those airports. I have a vested interest in this. So I don't have a problem, you know, trying to report this, but the, uh, uh, ethically, the problem was technical. Who do you call? There are no people at airports on the business side to take those kind of reports. How much do you fight to, to try to find these, this contact information? Um, ended up getting through to uh, somebody at a U.S. CERT that uh, ended up opening up 19 tickets, uh, one for each airport. And they basically sat down with each airport and said, hey, here's what was found publicly you know, no, no hacking required. You might want to do something about this. Now, some of it is, okay, we rent the IP address out to the coffee shop or whatever. And, you know, that's their problem, which is fair, but a lot of this stuff wasn't. Um, the best or, or worst, depending on your perspective, um, one airport had a half dozen Cisco routers. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Cisco Smart Install? Uh, short version is it's a it's not a bug it's a feature and I see Smitty back in the hallway holding a very large antenna and I'm pointing it at me 
like I'm I'm a little terrified here. <laughs> There's, uh, but it's meant for zero touch installation, so you could uh, 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 send this thing out to a remote office. It connects back to a central server, pulls its config and you know all the secrets and everything, and then uh, reboots, and it's functional. Great, sounds like a nice feature. Except their implementation royally sucked, and you can actually just send a single, I think it's a single packet, that will change the address that it pulls that config from to you. So now you can pull the, the running config, you can push a new one, um, you can upload uh, new firmwares, or just brick the damn thing. There was a half a dozen of these at McCarran Airport that almost all of you probably flew through to get here. Fortunately, one of their security guys I had had beers with the year before at DEF CON gave me his business card. So 11 o'clock at night when I find this, I'm rooting through my box as I never throw out business cards. Find his card, I'm texting him at you know some ungodly hour saying, hey, is this your IP address space? Yes. You might want to check out these devices on this, these ports. Oh, shit. Linked him to the exploit. It's like, oh, crap. And by 7 a.m. the next day, it was fixed. Turns out it was their upstream uh, provider that uh, had dropped these in and, and was problematic. Uh, the day after they fixed it, a, v a senior VP from the company showed up to apologize in person. But we're talking like full access to core Cisco switches at an airport. You can't sit by and, and know that and not do something. So at least with McCarran being uh, open and, and giving me that business card, you know, establishing that relationship um, was very valuable. When I have to fight to report something, you're not making it uh, uh, easy for me. My time's valuable to me, right? So at what point, you know, there is going to be a point where my ethic kind of runs out where it's like, I'm just going to let you stew. You know, I'm going to let you crash and burn. Okay. Maybe poor choice of words when talking about airports, but <laughs> you know, so what is the moral, ethical, legal responsibility to report problems to those who don't want to hear it? If they, you have to, you know, beg and cajole and it's, you know, stand outside their window screaming, at what point do you stop? Yeah, you know, this is this is the question out to you. In the back? I think, I think the biggest thing is everyone's always got a boss somewhere else. I mean, when you keep hitting the roadblock, you got to start getting creative. It means you have to poke the bear somewhere else. Eventually, you're going to find someone who's going to be pissed off enough that maybe they're going to try to figure out how to solve the problem, or you would hope at least. That's been my experience. Yeah, you're seeing, like, basically go up the chain. Or just go side chain. Maybe find somebody if I mean, and as, as was mentioned earlier, talking to social networks saying, hey, anybody know somebody who's inside and can point me to somebody who will listen? A key thing to keep in mind here is that whatever you, you, you discover will significantly affect others, like innocent people, right? And that's kind of a challenge that we've kind of faced a lot. The companies that we wanted to do a responsible disclosure wouldn't answer our emails at all. And it was like, this thing that you cannot go public with. It was just simply too dangerous to go public, but it had to be fixed. So, yeah. yeah, I mean... And, and, and yeah. this is, is the quandary that I, I found myself in a lot of times where it's like you're sitting on something that is so explosive, you know, so dangerous that you know somebody else is going to find it sooner or later. Can you sleep at night knowing that you could have done something when something really bad happens and it's, it's exploited? You know, that's... Back? Yeah. Yeah, saying that you know you got a battery or fuel tank of like how much you can put into it after a while you're just gonna be like screw it uh, 
organizations to learn. Oh, so if you have a minor exploit that causes them to pay, the organization itself can start changing. If somebody's pushing from the outside, the board hasn't changed. They'll fix that one problem, but they won't fix the yeah, he's talking about you know point you know point fix on you know specific vulnerabilities, not not the systemic problem that you know created this in the first place. Uh, last one. Yeah. Yeah. So she's talking about uh, where there's direct impact on on people, uh, as opposed to like a company's bottom line. In this case, we're talking potentially uh, the ability to screw with uh, uh, the airport in a way that could affect uh, uh, airplanes' ability to land. You're actually now worried about the butts and the seats in the sky. So. Another effort, uh, major Canadian wireless ISP, uh, 600 customer routers with Cisco Smart install wide open, thanks to Shodan. Uh, backtracking a little bit from that, they also had a uh, web server with a index directory with a template of the config with the exact same secrets already embedded in it. So you have the keys to the kingdom right there just from that, let alone the smart install thing. It took me three months of, you know, a couple of times a week making calls, making, you know, sending inquiries, filling out, you know, their web form or something saying, hey, you got a problem, we need to talk. And nobody would ever get back to me. It kept just dead ending in some, you know, inbox that nobody ever checked. Finally had to activate the social network to find somebody that had, you know, a friend or a colleague already embedded inside. Um, that was rather painful to have to deal with. Because again, you're sitting there and it's like, every day goes by and it's like, when is the other shoe gonna drop? When is something going to happen? Took, you know, they fixed it, took them about six weeks. Uh, they rolled it out in batches, you know, as, as one does. Um, their customers still have a crap load of issues, but at least the ISP's side of things is, is okay. Uh, we're talking like fuel management systems for you know city vehicle fleets, um, Coast Guard stations, uh, their fuel management systems, airports, uh, their uh, uh, some of the remote uh, um, camera systems. There was a, uh, a uh, one customer of theirs that had a uh, camera system overlooking a bunch of vehicles that were just being imported and being unloaded at a harbor. And it's like, this was a big part of their security system. You sit there, you look at night, and it's like there's one guy. And I'm looking through the security system. I'm seeing what they're recording. I can kick that recording, you know, turn that off, steal a whole bunch of vehicles. This is a problem. All right. Uh, funnily enough, the, the ISP actually doxed me and realized, oh, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. Maybe we should listen to him. He's not trying to extort us or anything. So at least I had the reputation and, and uh, uh, reliability from past experiences to uh, save me from uncomfortable situations and get them to you know, pay attention. Yep. I've got kind of a strange question. It says that you spent three months to try to get someone competent. Normally, my experience is, is that responsible disclosure, you wait many days after alerting the company before you make a renouncement. Did you think about making the announcement publicly saying, okay, all these customers are vulnerable and just naming and shaming? Uh, so he's talking about you know, naming and shaming responsible you know, versus responsible disclosure. You know, if you gave it your all, they didn't respond in 90 days. For me, th this is where it's, it's getting weird. Um, and we'll address some of that later. But in this particular case, this would probably have destroyed the ISP. And I don't want that blood in my hands. You know, it's if, if I gave them the information, they did nothing, you know, and I knew it reached the right people and I did chose to do nothing, that's all on them. If it's, you know, some tech support person or, or uh, a receptionist or something that just doesn't realize what this email means, or really, is that their fault in some ways? Eh, it, it, that's the weird ethical thing. 
What are companies' moral and ethical responsibilities to secure their services and equipment they provide to customers? You know, if you are buying something that's uh, touted as a secure service, what happens if you find out it's not secure? Like, how many IoT devices they say, you know, it says it's secure on the side of the box, and you <laughs> open it up and find, oh, there's Telnet, there's FTP, there's, you know, like, no, it's not. Um, so that's... saying that when it, 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 a lot of companies will play that legal parsing game of what does secure mean uh, it's like oh well you opened the box and powered it on therefore you know all, all warranties about security are void um, you know the most secure is a, a secure, secure computer is one covered in cement buried six feet below the earth you know you know that's not on so it, for me in this particular case because there's there wasn't necessarily a CVE associated with just having smart install installed it was a you know feature not a bug it didn't flag for them necessarily but it also shows the typical it thing of you know overworked underpaid under resourced understaffed that nobody looked at this stuff and nobody saw the open directory with the you know template uh, config file with all the secrets in it already So, Internet of Dongs. Yes, I hack sex toys. <coughs> no one's laughing. Thank you. <laughs> like, seriously, uh, the back of the business card I have says, y yes, we hack sex toys. Please stop laughing. And I give that to people while they're laughing at me. And they're like, you get this a lot, don't you? Like, yes. Um, this is an industry where people can be hurt. But strangely enough, no one else really wanted to look at this stuff. Um, not with any sort of, of seriousness. I don't suffer from a great deal of dignity. So I was looking for a project to do, you know, IOT, web app, mobile app stuff, you know, to learn. And quite frankly, this industry does not know what they don't know. It is really a, a target rich environment. So you got to find the low hanging fruit and, and uh, learn quite a bit. They were making 15 year old errors, you know, stuff that 15, 20 years ago we were dealing with, you know, direct object reference, SQL injection, stuff we're still dealing with, unfortunately. But they've never made a connected device before. You know, it's always been manually operated, you know, uh, you know, battery, you know, some wires, you know, uh, they've got materials people, they've got electrical engineers, they've got um, design engineers, but they've never made a connected device before. They, they bought some TI or, or Nordic chipset, you know, dev, uh, dev kit, and never had the chance to go to conferences like this, interact with people who say, you think that's a good idea? You know, so, and this is a rare case where the ethics get, interesting because they were genuinely naive. They didn't know what they didn't know. How do you face that then of like, I can't condemn you because there was no pathway for you to know, you know, they all go this, their trade shows and everything like that. They never would have exited that little bubble. And the stuff that I found over the, the year, uh, last couple of years with this stuff, full databases dumped with a single query to their web API, you know, uh, accounts where you can, you know, change the password to anything you want and hijack it. Therefore you become that, you know, user for better or worse. Now you're able to, uh, send invitations to other users to control their vibrator. Is that not sexual assault? Because it's under false pretenses. Full PII, um, one of the strangest and, and scariest ones was one device where uh, they had a search function so you could connect with, with other users. Every user had their, uh, they wanted to know how far away each user was from the other. Uh, there's multiple ways to do that calculation. They chose that in the search results, it embedded the GPS coordinates of the other user in the reply. 
And yeah, I would do the calculation locally. So I have maps of, you know, where people are in the world are masturbating. You know, <laughs> this is the, the joys of my life. <laughs> Uh, I've worked, reached out to multiple vendors uh, with uh, fairly great success because most of them say, you know, we care about the privacy and security of our, our customers. Well, do you? Do you know how? Uh, a lot of them have gone from uh, incredulous to incredibly thankful in the span of like one phone call because I literally hand them their butt on a platter not the 12 pound twerking butt from Pornhub. Uh, but, you know, it's like, here's your user database. How did you get this? I sent this string. Oh, shit. Uh, one had a MailChimp admin API key embedded in their app, full access to all their mail lists. Yes. So, talking about ethics and legal stuff, uh, one of the challenges that we're facing in that bring this up, I think, and this is is very very good question uh, so he's basically saying in this case where it's like I suddenly ended up with their entire user database uh, did I cross a, a legal moral ethical line I don't think I did because it was so incredibly simple that you know it was the sort of thing if if I can type it into the URL bar, that should never happen. You know that should not work. Um, that means your security is is so crap that I'm sorry you 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 don't deserve to complain. Uh, again, lawyers and everything would probably disagree, but oh, yeah. I mean, you know, but. It, Attackers don't uh, understand scopes. You know, they don't have, you know, it's out of scope, said no attacker ever. Men's ray. <laughs> what? What is your intent? Men's ray. Yeah, men's ray. Yeah, what, what's your actual intent? If you're actually trying to find something bad to help them. Yeah, in this case, because I, I never posted it anywhere and, you know, put it on Pastebin or anything, uh, I contacted the company, I, I told them how I did it. Uh, I never asked for anything. You know, if they offer, that's, you know, a different situation. Um, but it's amazing that the suspicion that still abounds when somebody comes up altruistically to say, hey, you've got a problem. So is anyone ever undeserving of privacy and security because of how they choose to live their lives? Because there are, what I've found is there are a ridiculous amount of researchers who would, I would never trust to, you know, hack sex toys because the maturity level needed and the professionalism needed just isn't there. You know, yes, there is stuff that is genuinely funny, but there are people who say, well, you know, they're a bunch of degenerates or something, you know, like they, they don't deserve our attention or anything. They, you know, they're making these judgments. For me, I'm looking at it as these are legal devices that, you know, are owned by adults. They are, uh, sold publicly, legal in most jurisdictions, a few exceptions, um, and it's consenting adults. Where's the problem? So. Oh, yep. I feel like the answer to that question is, well, no, no one's undeserving, but there's also different scales, like celebrities, for example, get less privacy in their life than a typical person, but further to the level, um, further to the security aspect, you, you made the comment before that if someone doesn't try hard enough to secure their data, then they're not deserving of the security around them. Uh, no, what I was saying was uh, that somebody who, who is not able to, does not take the minimum effort to secure their, their stuff, uh, doesn't get the right to uh, call me criminal because I you know change a parameter in a URL. Like if it's something that simple, as the fault is not with me for finding it, it's for you for creating such a shitty product. So, again, uh, with the Internet Dogs, found one MailChimp API key. 
I could see everyone who subscribed to their mail lists, so customers, uh, drafts of things. I could also send as them. Didn't test that, but I had full admin access over the API. Again, three months to get a reply. Uh, I even had to cull the, mar the mail lists for any of their, their domain email addresses uh, and just carpet bomb them. Like send it to everybody, including like CEO and everybody. Finally got a response back with like, somebody talk to this guy. He's being persistent. Uh, I never tell them exactly what I found in the first email because usually there's a lot of incredulousness and, and explaining that needs to happen. So I prefer to get on a Skype call. Um, we'd set up the call and then there was a few emails back and forth. And then somebody hit reply all. <laughs> I contacted him today via mail uh, with app devs, uh, app devs looped in. We're already resolving potential security flaws in the app uh, to make sure we fix it. Also, I offered him to hop on a call with team to see what his real agenda was. And like, again, they don't believe altruism exists. When I confronted them with this, it was friggin' hilarious. They just like wilted. It's like, oh, crap. <laughs> you heard that. <laughs> but but if that was after I showed them, oh, here's your MailChimp API key. Here's what I could do. Here's links to the MailChimp API documentation on how to fix this. Um, I did all their work for them, basically. And then they're like, oh, yeah. And so you thought I was going to be a bad guy. Like, and they're like, yeah, we did. Sorry. <laughs> Talking about smack about somebody behind their back. Is that any different into their face. I mean, if you've ever done any sort of tech support, I mean, the things that tech support sees, hears, and deals with users make you want to smack them. But there's a certain level of professionalism, and I find it tends to cloud your uh, uh, judgment and how you approach the, uh, these challenges. Like, will you put in more uh, time to try to find a way to disclose something uh, if you dismiss them. So if you dismiss this one company, well, somebody else who does something is equally dumb in your mind. Is some other factor going to suddenly, oh, because it's a sex toy, oh, no, they don't need any uh, uh, of my help kind of things. It, it, I, I love those penny drop moments when you they realize they're pwned. Um, they fixed it right away, sent me some free test devices. Uh, but with the IOD stuff, because you are dealing with something that is very personal um, and you have things like lithium polymer batteries in very sensitive locations, the Samsung showed those like to catch fire if you, you know, draw too much current and such. Uh, the Chinese OEMs and, and other white box vendors, they're really hard to get a hold of. Um, I wish more IoT vendors would look at the sex toy uh, industry, because they've been very responsive, very responsible, and have taken this where they need to go and, and, and sought out the help they needed um, when confronted with the reality of, hey, your shit sucks. But then you just face plant into stuff tangentially. Is it an ethical issue if someone genuinely does not know better and contracts a third party that's an idiot? I mean, kind of related to that, because I've, I've been thinking of this through the last few questions. At what point does a security researcher, whoever is finding these things, at what point do they kind of throw up their hands and say, you know what, I've tried to share with you what this is, why it's bad, how it happened, blah, blah, blah. This, this is the, the question I always have. It becomes this obsession of, I have to get them to fix this thing because that's when, you know, I feel like I've won, you know, particularly if it's something dangerous to, to you know, health or, or har you know, harming a person. Those are things I need to know to sleep at night. So how's this for bad? Bluetooth device connects to a mobile app, web API backend. We've all seen these sort of things. Oh, yes. Hey, me too. <laughs> yeah, they're putting yourself at risk by disclosing this like the good way. But have you ever thought of going another way? Like 
We'll get to that. <laughs> oh, uh, the question was, you know, this seems dangerous. Uh, you know, have you ever thought that there could be like harm to yourself? Uh, should you just go anonymous? I'm like, ah, we're going to get to that. So long story short, in this case, within two minutes of looking at this product, I'm looking at personal identifying information. I am looking at everything. There is not a directory in this thing that isn't indexed. Um, they're leaking source code for everything, uh, including the, the website uh, and the, the API backend, hard-coded secrets, everything. Their iOS developer signing key was in there too. So I could sign a new version of their iOS app. Backup files with MySQL passwords, a uh, .git folder with a copy of everything. Um, there was just... It was the worst thing I'd ever seen in terms of a product. And that was just 20 minutes to find all of that. It was a piece of jewelry meant for safety calls. <laughs> there was a brooch or a bracelet or a necklace that, you know, uh, uh, you could tap, you know, one or two or three times. And it would uh, interact with your phone and make a call out to like, hey, you know, creepy guys being creepy, come get me, you know, uh, at the, from the bar. Uh, you know, other ones would, you know, fake a phone call. Or there's a, you know, sound an alarm. Good idea. Good product. You know, nice, uh, a very simple way to, you know, just tap something uh, uh, on your wrist that you're playing with and alert a friend to come help you. But as you see, using this product would be incredibly dangerous. Uh, it was get my Ivy. Uh, it is now defunct. They uh, were selling almost exclusively through Amazon, um, not very well because you could see all the customer registrations. You could see how many they were selling. Um, but this is a safety device. This is the sort of thing that a freaking stalker would love, right? Because there's also like GPS coordinates in this stuff. I mean, we're talking about moral and ethical failing. Um, these guys did, failed to do anything to protect their customers. If you don't set out with the intention of building an insecure product, like nobody intentionally builds an insecure product, but you end up doing so anyways. If you hear about these problems, you have in a lot of minds an ethical responsibility to fix it. But if you make sure that you never hear that there's a problem, you know, stick your fingers in your ears and go la 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 la. You know, what is that? Yeah, very unethical. <laughs> um, I'm, but the scary part is that company also made medical devices. So I've had a lot of successes over the years. Wait, 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 I want to ask you a question. Sure. I had a thought. Take it back a slide. So if you want to ask a question, have it right here. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
But beyond that, if you don't have a technical knowledge about the, the product, you are kind of going blind and saying, please be safe, please be safe. And yeah. so this, is, this is exactly the problem, especially with security products, because what happens is, and I don't mean to steal your talk, but we have a two-hour slot so that we could all run our mouths. And um, the, the problem is, as researchers, what, we really, what we're really trying to do is find a balance between getting the word out to the consumer, not being branded a criminal. I mean, this conference, you know, I remember 10, 15 years ago coming to this conference in a plane going home, and I, I described to people what we were doing. I was at a hacker convention, and, they, and the, the person in the plane's like, criminals have conventions? <laughs> I mean... Lawyers have conventions. <laughs> oh, it's the same thing. Yeah, I mean, like, well, you know, lots of different... Criminals have conventions, uh, but it's uh, well, Congress. <laughs> <laughs> there, there might be Congress that, here later, lawyers, so that, that's just wow. stick around. This is policy day. Um, the whole thing, though, right, man, it's like you know, we've been dealing with this for decades. Where back in the '90s, we used to just drop code and fuck shit up. And this is the only way you could communicate with vendors. And they finally learned a lesson. It's like, okay, we need to make things at least minimally better so that I can't just send three or four bytes of data and completely destroy your computer. And, you know, you won't be able to recover it back and you're going down to Best Buy and the guy's going to come and fix it for you. And um, so they've gotten a little better. But then it's, it also gets worse because now it's like, oh, well, you have to uh, download all of these security updates automatically. And then the, the company starts to take uh, liberties with that. So everybody might have or use a program or heard of a program called Windows, right? What's that? I don't know what you're talking about. So in, in the United States, a lot of people use Windows. So you, you have a problem in Linux. It's known as System D. So now he's got his head down in shame, right? So... The automatic update does more things than just fix security problems. It always adds and removes features that the consumer may or may not know about, right? And so now the pendulum is swinging back towards the vendors where they're just indiscriminately changing things in software. A software manufacturer is like, God, he can change physics. Look at the the F-35... fighter jet, there's a simulator in one of the villages, you can actually go and play with it, you know. That is a, a fighter jet that has been completely obsoleted because it was basically software. Yeah, it's basically a, a soft, you know, you heard of a, a software-defined networking, it's a software-defined airplane, basically. Yeah, and so it's out of business. So, like, the, we have a B-52 bomber in this country. The Somebody told me something that was interesting. The mother of the last person to fly a B-52 bomber hasn't been born yet. Wow. You know, that plane is designed to last for another 100 years. All of the stuff that we're making now, which is so tied to the software, and, and it's, it's built into the sales cycle of companies now, we're becoming these, this, um, you know, consumers are just taking this hardware and software and just chucking it away. And Much so, like beer, you know, you, you, you no, don't buy beer, you just rent it. Right. We're no, not buying products anymore. We are getting a license for it. So, so ultimately, I think, I guess the ethical and unethical question is, as a company, you know, is the company ethically responsible to build a secure product? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm asking, we have cards. I mean, <laughs> you know, we paid a couple hundred bucks for cards. We want to use them because... You know, the DEF CON folks said we needed to have a more interactive vi- village. And when we talk about policy and ethics, it's very hard for us because we can't have a shiny thing that you can solder. <laughs> this is something, this is policy, right? So is it ethical? Should we make secure products? But if people keep buying them, why should we care? Because it'll be gone. It'll be gone in two years. It'll be obsolete. Is it even worth it? You got something to say to this? Yeah, well, I mean, in the U.S., I mean, it is a lot more clear now. Like, that kind of stuff, uh, like, the Federal Trade Commission has gone after companies like D-Link. Um, yeah. put, like, secure on their boxes. 
when in fact it, they had like default passwords. Yeah, you're, you're starting to see action by, as you say, FTC and others. Right. But when you get There'll like white box. folks from the FTC here later today. Yeah. <laughs> so, but this should have been happening 10 years ago. It, you know. Right, I mean, and, and like some of the stuff you were addressing earlier about like the responsible disclosure, I mean, or like you're getting into the, like the CFAA, I mean, they, like the Attorney General's office here, right? Is Would you like to come up and, come on, mm -hmm. come on, yeah, yeah, we got our first question right, go ahead. So some of the stuff you were talking about earlier, um, really with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, I mean, it is gray when you start to like send in probably commands to dump stuff out of the databases. I mean, historically, they typically don't go after prosecutors, usually don't go after. Yeah, I mean, this like, one, you looked actors. at it funny, and it just barfed everything out at you. So. Right. I mean, usually, if you're the end result of what you're trying to get the data for is for a good purpose, they typically don't, even though they might be able to legally. Having dealt with a number of other companies before, you show kind of a, a precedent and that, no, I, I haven't bit, done anything malicious in the past. Me saying, well, no, I was about to call them to report this actually holds water so yeah and so and then what they and in the um uh the department of justice here in the united states published like guidelines for corporations to actually roll out their own responsible disclosure programs so both the ftc and like the doj are, are pushing corporations to actually have those programs so they can receive them responsibly and then they must act upon them and push out firmware updates and stuff but there's yeah it, that's only like within literally the last like two years yeah. where we're starting to get some of that push from a federal level. Yeah. IoT yeah. Village will have a hell of a lot more on that. Anyways, let's move on. Um, I've been successful. Uh, haven't had any major problems uh, at that point. Um, but it's you know, basically Russian roulette with a, a lawyer in the chamber. You know, somebody can have a bad day and just decide, yep, we'll stick the lawyers on them. And then you've got to get one to deal with uh, responding and it's like it's they're gonna make your life hell as you were saying you know a comment earlier yeah there's a lot of great personal risk this shoot the messenger thing is quite rampant um this uh, uh atriant company made a uh, uh makes the the like the total rewards kiosks for the the membership clubs and the casinos they had a shitload of those sitting on showdown right publicly available you know, you could get uh, uh, access to PII on these things. They reported it to the, the company who, you know, initially were, were responsive. But then I think they looked at how much it would cost to fix this and started just cold shouldering and, and ignoring the researchers. Researchers are like, well, when are you going to get this fixed? You know, you're, you're supposed to, to get going on this. When are you going to do it? And they wouldn't reply. One of the researchers went to the – to a, a – convention with one of the VPs or the CEO of, of uh, this company and after this guy's talk confronted him and says, hey, I'm, I'm that guy, I'm the researcher. What are you doing about this thing? Are you going to fix this? He got punched in the face. Nice. Seriously. Whoa. Yeah, uh, I've got the link uh, if you want it. Um, speaking up about something may in, you know, others may uh, start digging into your past. Not 100% sure with the case of malware tech, but his past came back to haunt him because he suddenly found himself in the limelight. If you are sitting on, you know, knowing that this, this really bad thing could happen, but you're afraid of drawing attention to yourself, again, this is going to anonymous disclosures and such like that, but we all know that you piss off the wrong people, they won't stop spending money trying to figure things out. You know, you can always be traced back somehow. Um, I still feel an obligation when I know something is bad because I like to sleep. And knowing that I could have done something and didn't is a terrible, terrible feeling. If there's going to be great personal cost, is it ethical to not disclose? This says it's unethical. You're saying it's unethical, right? I kind of agree with you. You're saying ethical. Okay, there's a lot more unethicals going on. That means you're decent human beings in my book. That you are, are you're wanting to help people. You're wanting to save lives. You are, are what I want the hacker community to be more like. But I'm a lawyer. Well, 
you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll forgive you for that for now. <laughs> we'll allow that today. Oh. But hey, you can hack the law. But you can find loopholes or, or ways to argue a case that set precedent to fix some of these things. So that that is a type of hacker. Right. So it. In this new age of responsible disclosure, coordinated disclosure, they don't work unless the companies behave in an ethical way. Companies are not incentivized to secure things right off the bat unless it's going to affect their bottom line. Um, if they're not you know, woke, they don't know they need to take reports from the public. They don't know they need to take have a, a vulnerability disclosure program uh, and a way to communicate with everything. Um, some companies will be like, oh, hey, we've got this bug bounty. Oh, you found this bad thing. You know, here's 10 grand and an NDA. Now you can't talk about it because that 10 grand is a lot cheaper than actually paying to fix it. So it's just capture and kill. We need to start calling out these really egregious examples and outright liars, those with like secure on the box that it isn't. Um, those that do take reports but don't act on them. Um, you need to be careful. And I found this out the hard way. Note that earlier when I was describing my employment, I said I was working for ATB Financial. On October 10th, 2018, right after DerbyCon, I got fired. Just called into a meeting room and said, we no longer need your services. Uh, to say I was stunned was a, a understatement. Um, no reason given, just vague allusions to oh, violation of, of confidentiality or something. And I'm like, I'm a hacker. I'm an IT professional. I'm a security guy. Confidentiality and personal integrity is all I have at, to trade on. If I am suddenly seen as having violated confidentiality, I'm burned. <laughs> like, you know, burn notice on me. I, I am persona non grata. This was incredibly um, traumatizing to me. Had I been in a headspace I was two years ago, I probably would have killed myself. It was that hurtful um, to be let go of that suddenly in that way. I am a new man. I, I am a, a uh, my challenges with mental health are, are well documented on Twitter, um, but. I'm also a hacker, so I did what I do best, and I started digging. Because suddenly, I had a lot of free time. <laughs> I'm not even going to pose the moral and ethical questions. I'm just going to start like listing what happened and the, and the facts here and, and let you decide them. But, so here's what happened. The B-Sides Edmonton Conference, uh, September tw uh, 2018, the first day the, the CISO of Service Alberta who owns the government of IP, government of Alberta's IP blocks said, we scan and fix problems all the time in our IP space during a panel. I'm sitting in the audience, I get on my phone, I look at Shodan, and I'm like, no, you're not. You know, because I'm seeing all sorts of stuff that should definitely not be there in their IP space. I added some slides to my talk the next day um, and a few selected examples. Uh, screenshots of administrative pages without passwords for printers, um, lists of the, the Shodan entries for servers that had 50 plus vulnerabilities listed. Um, didn't redact the IPs or any other information. I'm like, this is already public. This is out here. This is what I found. Why are you saying that you're, you're fixing these things when I can find this on my phone? Um, there's an end-of-life Novell server, a uh, Twonky Media server with a bunch of pirated movies on it. Um, and again, I did this in like two minutes. I spoke to the CISO uh, that day and sent him a message that night that I was going to use some of these as examples in my talk. Uh, he responded positively, saying that, yeah, we don't want anybody getting in trouble for uh, you know, pointing out something that's already on Showdown. Gave my presentation, had these slides, called out his comments. Uh, at no time did I disclose who my employer was. I was operating as a private citizen as far as I was concerned or as, as I thought the public was concerned. 
uh, sent a complete list of the issues that I had listed as well as others I had found uh, to the CISO two days later. Uh, had lunch with him a week later. Everything seemed cool. He was like, yeah, you ruffled some feathers, but, you know, we're getting stuff fixed. Like, you know, thanks. You're, you're um, doing good. You're, you're making things better. Cool. Uh, posted the slides to the local uh, security community Slack. One of the employees that had asked for the, uh, this was an employee of, of the government of Alberta at Service Alberta. And he was going to pass this up to his superiors because they were curious what was in the slides so they could, you know, I, I wanted to be transparent. So I gave them to this knowing who it was and where it would go. That's fine. Um, returned from DerbyCon and then was effectively immediately fired. The vague allusions to violating confidentiality, they briefly mentioned like the, a presentation. It was literally one of those, well, you know what you did. No, really, I, I didn't. Like, you let me stay here for a month after that, and everything seemed cool. Like, what heck? What happened? Uh, engaged a labor lawyer to I know my options. You know, deal with the the, the legal stuff. Um, at one point, we inquired as to why I got fired, and the response from ATB's legal department was filled with demonstrable inaccuracies. Um, things like that I had use some private data source or something that uh, a privileged data source for this. I'm like, no, it's Shodan. I, you want the links right now? Um, it, there was just a lot of, of things that was like, okay, some things, yes, may have pushed a line, but you're, you're accusing me of things. So the whole story that they had was muddied. Um, you know, operating as a private citizen, not as an employee of the bank. So I started FOIP requests, uh, Freedom of Information requests. Um, the CISO in their, their communications confirmed I was operating as a private citizen and not as an ATB employee uh, because I talked to him. He, you know, I had mentioned that you know, I, I work for this bank and everything. Uh, he, you know, it was brought into the conversation, but it was a case of, oh, by the way, yeah, he works for ATB, but that's not how he was operating. So even he had my back in this case. Um, their concern was that I was airing their dirty laundry and were concerned that I worked for ATB and was, was you know, maybe I was going rogue or something. I, I don't know. It was lots of redactions. Uh, the now current CISO referred to me as a psycho at one point, which was fun. Um, but no one denied that the vulnerabilities existed. They were just more concerned with the fact that, you know, as I say, airing their dirty laundry. February 2019, I finally had a meeting with my ex-managers after much negotiation uh, and the C, uh, chief security officer at ATB. While I could counter the factual inaccuracies of what legal had sent, um, ultimately it came down to violation of code of conduct. Uh, Part of the code of conduct says communicate and act in a way that does not embarrass yourself or ATV both during and after work hours. Do they know me? Like, did they research me at all before they hired me? Like, if, if you trip and fall on the street and I laugh at you, oh, that, that's embarrassing. Does that mean you now have to fire yourself? Like, it's, it's such a subjective thing that you could spend the entire weekend arguing, you know, the semantics of, of this, but... Um, ultimately, that's what they got me on, was that they did not like what I did, therefore, let me go. And legally, they could, which is unfortunate for me, but you know, I can't blame them. The biggest problem was that because ATB was owned by the government of Alberta, yes, it is. Oh, okay. even though I was operating in a private capacity, they... Uh, thought I had the potential to cause serious harm in our relationship with the owner, according to the uh, legal letter I got. I, I failed to see what harm that could be. Um, again, it was surprising to, to hear all this. Um, basically, someone at Government of Alberta had communicated to ATB management that they had concerns about this presentation and, and my actions. Um, the CSO confirmed that I 
uh, confirmed to me, and I, I have no reason to not believe him, that no one told him, you know, fire his ass or, or anything. That it was ultimately his decision and uh, one that he felt was appropriate for what happened. Um, all the data was public. Confidentiality was not broken. Um, they have The government of Alberta has no official vulnerability reporting mechanism. There is no email address or, or way to report a vulnerability. Again, operating as a private citizen, I had gotten permission from the Service Alberta CISO to present the information. I thought I had covered my bases. That's where I screwed up. So Service Alberta is a department that is listed as the owner of the IP blocks. The problem is Service Alberta allocates them to the different ministries, agencies, you know, et cetera. There is no overarching government structure to oversee any of this. Everyone is their own silo. They, own, they all do their own thing. Um, there are some vague standards they have to adhere to, but they don't. Th there's no one watching. There, there's no one watching. Um, I had permission from the CISO Service Alberta to talk about stuff that was Service Alberta, but he had zero authority to give me permission to speak about anything else I had found, and there's no way to tell where those lines are in the IP space. So the service, uh, the, the server that had 50 plus CVEs listed in a showdown actually belonged to the Ministry of Justice. And you can expect they're going to have a lot of lawyers and be, you know, kind of pissed off. But since I had time on my hands, I want to say how bad the problem was. Sitting down with Shodan, the end result was 176 IPs, 3,200 vulnerabilities within their uh, IP space alone. Uh, that's not with stuff that was third-party hosted or, or uh, other sites outside of that net block. We're talking root passwords and files, the uh, admin consoles for F5s publicly facing. Uh, one server, the, the record was 122 CVEs on one server. And this is just with Shodan and Map basic tools, like nothing weird. In short, their IP space is a shit show, right? Anybody can go and look and see this. Like this is not a secret. This is not confidential information. I wanted to get it fixed still. I had been fired. I had been traumatized. I couldn't let it go. I needed to know that I had made things better and that there was something good coming out of all of this. Couldn't trust the CISO's office. There was no central authority. Uh, several oversight departments within the, the government of Alberta I engaged. Um, even they were having trouble wrapping their brains around it. Uh, they were thinking I was like vexatious. I was trying to uh, uh, be vengeful or something like that. And I'm like, no, just here's the information. Here's what it means. Fix this stuff. Like, I'm not trying to get a job back or anything like that. I'm just trying to get, do the right thing here. It took its sweet time, moved at the speed of government, you know, as these things do. Uh, March 2019, I was sent a letter from uh, the Ministry of uh, Service Alberta acknowledging the findings finally. So it's like, yes, I'm not crazy. They, they actually, you know, uh, acknowledge that there are problems. They directed me to continue sending any reports to the, uh, the CISO's office at Service Alberta. Uh, their own standards say high-risk vulnerabilities will be fixed in 30 days. Okay. I got this letter, and that started the clock for me. You, know, you now know about it. You've acknowledged you know about it. Now you should start fixing things. Three weeks into this, I'm in LA. I'm not seeing any changes in this IP space. So send a message to my friend that works for the uh, uh, government. And uh, he calls the CISO's office and basically repeats what I had said to him, which was, um, hey, your standard says 30 days. That's coming up next week. <laughs> We have an election coming up. You know, please fix this. Because we were having a provincial election just over a week. 
Uh, and there's a lot of concerns about election security lately for various reasons. And he called their office and, and you know, spoke to someone there and, and passed along the message. They called the cops on me. Apparently, I made threats. And I'm walking along the beach in, in L.A. and just laughing my ass off at this because the, the cop phoned me and says, oh, can you come in for an interview uh, or can we visit you? Well, if you come and visit me, you better book a ticket. Um, you know, I'm, I'm currently in L.A. and they're like, oh, are you coming back? Like, yes. Like, <laughs> um, cops have read the communications and basically said, there's nothing here. But there's an official complaint. You know, we have to investigate. Um, they wanted me to come to police HQ. Uh, no, not happening. Um, they wanted to come to my home. I have a doormat that says come back with a warrant. <laughs> that ain't happening either. You know, they kept saying, oh, don't worry, we're not going to arrest you. Don't worry. I'm like, well, cops are allowed to lie. Uh, your words mean nothing. Sorry. Uh, so figured neutral ground. Met at a coffee shop. You know, walked them through all the data, you know, showed them communications uh, I'd had uh, with the ministry, said, you know, hey, I've been working this, I've been trying to get them to fix this stuff. You're Albertans too. You've got information in these systems. You know, your butt's in the line too. Um, and as citizens, they were very thankful for this. Um, unbeknownst to them, my girlfriend here, Circuit Swan, was two tables away listening to all of this and sitting on a dead man switch that if things had gone sideways and they arrested me and everything, everything would have gone public. Um, thankfully that wasn't needed. They were actually very uh, professional, very good. Their, uh, uh, their good cop, bad cop routine needs a lot of work. It was <laughs> say, Oh yeah. Uh, because they had nothing to, hit me with. It was funny. Um, and the funny part is, after talking with the uh, the cops, uh, their deficit of skills in like them not knowing what Shodan was or how I was determining all this stuff, I think I'm going to be teaching them classes here soon. <laughs> uh, told them to pass along to the CISO's office that this was ridiculous and that we need to like bury a hatchet. So it's like, call me. Um, two days later, the uh, new CISO did reach out. Uh, we met for coffee. This is the guy that called me Psycho, by the way. Um, we met for coffee, got on the same page because everyone was just knee jerking and assuming I was, I was doing something malevolent. Talking with him, I'm like, I gave you all this information. I didn't ask for anything. Like, I've, I've given away any leverage I have. How am I doing anything bad. I'm like, yes, I could go to the media or something like that, but then shit's going to hit the fan and these things are probably going to be uh, exploited. Don't want that. So GOA's reaction in response to my pointing out the emperor had no clothes got me fired, uh, caused ambiguous reasons to, uh, given why I was fired and very well could have destroyed me mentally. Potential damage to reputation, career, you know, path because I, I violated confidentiality when I have evidence I didn't. Um, and this was only after finding like a half a dozen little things and putting them in a slide in a small B-Sides conference. They suddenly gave me a lot of time. And I realized how big the problem is and made their life worse. In a way, they, they egged that on. Continuing to fight to report, uh, uh, to, uh, get my reporting to them, calls to action, like saying, guys, come on, like my information's in these systems, your information's in these systems, let's secure this. Uh, I had every reason not to want to help them. I, I think we were all in agreement with that one that I, I had every reason to be pissed, but I didn't. I, I, I kept going with this. Um, Eventually, you know, after they called the cops on me and everything like that, it's like I, I get the feeling somebody there doesn't like me. Um, my patience may run out one day, but I haven't hit that yet, and I see no reason why it's going to. I 
sleep very well at night knowing that I've made things better because as a direct result, they uh, are overhauling all their governance of IT security. The, uh, they've created a task force to specifically go through the list of things I found. Um, they've been given, uh, that task force has been given the power to make fixes like, no, you will not, you will stop whatever project you're on and you will fix this now level. Uh, I became the stick that they needed to get other security initiatives going because I was now, um, you know, the fly in the ointment. I was, I was the thorn in their side uh, that they needed internally because there are good people there that were trying to do the right thing, but they couldn't get, you know, the, the political uh, uh, weight behind them. Now they could. It's improving. They've uh, fixed a lot of these things. Some ministries are faster than others. Um, a lot of ministries apparently don't have dedicated staff for such the incidences or uh, for you know dealing with these sort of things. There's a lot of ass covering that seems to be occurring, but that happens with everywhere. So in the end, me being fired actually made things a hell of a lot better. Not because I got fired, but because I suddenly had reason to dig to want to make things even better. So, silver lining? <laughs> so, there's a lot of issues with disclosure of vulnerabilities nowadays that I, you know, speaking as myself, have a, have a problem with. It's fraught with so many dangers. We need something like, you know, whistleblower laws. My biggest problem was everybody said, oh, well, you could have reported this you know, through a whistleblower or something like, no, that's if you work for the company. And, you know, if I've been uh, wanting to, to, if I found a vulnerability within the bank and wanted to report it or something like that, yes, the whistleblower's uh, statutes would have covered me. But even though we were owned by the government, I had no standing because we were an arm's length crown corporation. I had no standing to uh, report these things to the government and get the whistleblower protection. So as a member of the public, if you go up and say, hey, your fly's down, and they take exception to that, well, you have no recourse. That's scary. Well, you need something in the books for, to prevent retaliation um, against members of the public who are reporting things um, with positive intentions and, and goodwill. Um, because companies and governments can retaliate all they want against the public. There's no protections right now. Um, if you see something, say something. You know, the New York Police Department's catchphrase after 9-11. Uh, you kind of you, you stop and think twice about saying anything if you know that, well, if you piss off the wrong person or, or the um, kill the, the wrong golden goose, you know, because if somebody's perhaps uh, doing something shady and, and embezzling or, or some sort of fraud or something like that, you pointing out, hey, this vulnerability exists could potentially cost them a lot of money. They're going to get really pissed. And if they're in a position of power, you've got no report, recourse. We're all, we are worse for it. When we all see the same problem and don't speak up. There's so many people I've talked to that have, have seen these things. It's like, yeah, you know, you know, company ABC, yeah, I know about this vulnerability in this thing and that, but like they're, they got lawyers, they're scary. I'm not going to say a thing. And you hear that from like a whole bunch of people that all know the same thing, but they've never compared notes. Nothing's going to get fixed because everybody's running around scared. We need to take them that fear out of disclosure. My suggestions, again, a whistleblower protections that are, you know, done in good faith uh, for the greater good, prevent, you know, slap suits, which is strategic lawsuit against public participation, usually used against, uh, you know, suing some group into oblivion just to, to keep them busy so they don't, uh, uh, can't campaign against you or cause problems. There should be critical infrastructure reporting mechanisms at every city, state, country level that if, you know, yeah, if you, if you call it critical infrastructure, 
And I could be charged, you know, in addition, you know, because it's critical infrastructure, you should have a way of doing things and reporting things properly. You know, let meet me halfway here. You know, you may not want me poking at it, but if I do find something, let me find, you know, let me report it. Let me do the right thing. And you hold up your end and actually fix the damn thing. I'm doing free work for you. There's a group of us here, this year, called the Lonely Hacker Collective. Uh, Lonely Hacker Collective. Oh, yes. That, isn't that a oxymoron? <laughs> you know, a Lonely Collective. So this is a group that we call the Lonely Hacker Collective, all of us individuals who are coming to Vegas who we didn't come with other people. Uh, it's called LHC. And during, we have a Telegram group here going on. Yes. Okay, cool, huh? Do you know what we found accidentally on, on this group? We found from CERN, does anyone know what CERN is? Yeah, uh, yeah. we found a, uh, one of the nuclear cyclotrons on the internet, publicly, no creds. You just logged in, you do whatever you want. We actually figured out from the ASN who actually the owner was. We contacted, contacted them, four hours later it was offline. So, example yeah. of what you're exactly no, this is, about. This is good. Yeah, but it's like four hours. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is that you had to look up the ASN and everything and, and figure out the why wasn't there a, a you know security text file in the on their web page for instance you know or something yes yeah so in the United States critical infrastructure does and I don't know how it works for each one but you can go to National ISAC I S A C National ISAC has all the various sectors of critical infrastructure. And that's the way that they communicate vulnerabilities back and forth. So they're having be trying to report all the airport stuff I found uh, was difficult because most of those groups are very closed. You have to be in industry or have some reason to be part, there. As a member of the public, I can't just like wander in and say, "Ah, uh, hey guys, uh, shit's on fire." You know, like <laughs> so the FTC yeah. is going isn't FTC to here today? Yeah, they're on. That should be something they should be poked in the eye with. That's me. <laughs> oh. Go poke her in the eye. <laughs> oh, that was easy. <laughs> so. Would you like to come up? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Erie. My name is Erie. I'm a Fed. I work at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, I was the one who hooted for you. What you're saying is really important. Um, by the blood, sweat, and tears of a lot of people who will be here, like Eric Mill and other security folks in the federal government, we recently published a standard for federal agencies to have a way for disclosures to be submitted. My agency is still not doing it. Um, so when you talked about the people inside who are like trying, I, I'm not on the security team. I just give a shit about it. Um, so uh, when you say people in, on the inside need fuel to be able to fix things, it's really, really important. So I, I slap people in the face with white papers, but uh, your advocacy is awesome. Poke me in the eye later. I'll be here having a coffee. I'm very happy to talk about what's fucked up in government. <laughs> That's awesome. That was easy. Hey, Imani, we found another one of the speakers. <laughs> Have you, have you heard from Andrea yet? Oh, so Andrea, the, the organizer of the afternoon um, portion of this is still MIA. She did get her three badges, though. <laughs> what? All right. All right. We're going to give her a hard time. She's got 20 minutes. She's got 20 minutes to show up. All right. I've got like one or two slides here, and then uh, we can get discussion going. Uh, better training for law enforcement. When I'm having to explain what I'm doing and why it's not, you know, illegal or dangerous and, and stuff like that, well, that was funny yet embarrassing. So law enforcement needs to know and, and be that. Yeah, these were the the cybersecurity, uh, like the, the 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 cyber cops, basically. Like they work with IT. Uh, uh, their IT department and everything, and had to go has to go to like the cops IT department to ask like, okay, so what is what is this thing this guy's charged with? Like, what the hell did he do? <laughs> like, okay, I think we need to put a little more money into training here. Um, someone needs to get fired once in a while. Not, <laughs> yeah, and not in the case of like me for reporting, but for like if you, <laughs> we've all seen them, some person that just. 
is the problem that, that just, a head needs to roll once in a while. Keeps people on their toes. So my suggestions if you're ever doing disclosure, just in general, document the hell out of everything. Save copies of emails, you know, uh, all communications, uh, even if, uh, 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 like record phone calls if you can, if it's legal. Uh, do it by text. Be professional and proper in your communications, notes, everything. Yeah, okay, there's some communications that came up in the FOIP stuff that I'm looking back and I'm like, okay, I didn't help myself there because I was kind of glib or, you know. Um, get it in writing. Uh, employer agreements on public speaking. Like, get them get something from them that says, you know, we want to vet all your talks or not because there was some ambiguity with my case where they never asked to see any of my talks. They would just ask like, oh, what's it about? You know, or, but they took great exception and said that, oh, we have, the, we have this policy with you that, you know, you would uh, uh, we would vet your talks. And then if you'd followed that, you know, this, this would have been avoided. I'm like, no, we had never done that before. Suddenly saying you're going to do it now, yeah, well, didn't seem right. Um, if you do security research, possibly get a lawyer on retainer. I, I'm looking into this of just having somebody to phone when I have a question of like, where's the line? But also when somebody comes back at you and freaking out at you, you say, talk to my lawyer, which will often shut them up. Because they may not want to spend the money on a lawyer, but it, it, it puts you on a much e even playing field with them. Um, be friendly with the media. You know, collect business cards. There's media around here. They, they are, you don't have to give them anything ever, but just keep those communication channels open uh, and have that as a nuclear option. You know, uh, in my case, the cops, the, the, their only major concern seemed to be that if I started tweeting everything out, you know, with links to like the CVEs, which may or may not include like a, a link to the vulnerability, it became an, a, a, an issue of how many steps it was before you could get to, you know, put the vulnerability with the IP address. So if it was three clicks, it was allowed, but two was too much. So I couldn't link to the vulnerability directly in a tweet with the IP address, but I could link to a page that linked to it. This is why you need lawyers. You know, and no local laws about incitement to commit a crime, because that's what they were saying was, you know, if I started going to Twitter, am I inducing, you know, am I egging somebody on to commit a crime? In the end, I wouldn't change much about what I did. If there was some single thing I could have changed to not get fired and not, but still make the point I wanted to, I would. Change some phrasing, but you still have to hold truth to power. Sometimes, you know, lighting a fire under the powers that be requires you to light the powers that be on fire. I found a nasty problem. It's getting fixed for the better. Got through the emotional stuff with my friends, the hacker family, you know, it's a good community out here. I got a better job, better pay, better boss. And six months of unemployment actually gave me a lot of time to, you know, get my own shit together. Lots of those little life things that pile up that you needed to do. It was, the house is clean. The house is clean, she says. <laughs> my personal morals and ethics are intact and also my integrity. So, so discuss, disclose your own risk. I've had many, many successes. One very spectacular failure. Um, just in general, never use me as a role model for anything. Uh, feel free to ask questions. I've got documentation on all this, uh, but you know, if this story can help make a point to, to somebody else to make it better change, uh, make things better, feel free. Um, do what allows you to keep your head high. You know, you could be, people could say, well, it's not your responsibility. It's not your job. You know, you, know you, you shouldn't have to worry about that. If you feel worried about it, do something about it. You know, fight. Never give up pushing back when you know you're right but also cover your ass. <laughs> Read the fine print, know what you're getting into. Feel free to ask for help. EFF is a wonderful resource. I've had to use them a couple of times on talks just to make sure I don't cross any lines. 
because nobody should have to go through this crap like I did. But anyways, thank you. And I guess we'll have some, some questions and discussions. So. How are we? How are we on time? Well, I mean, there's time, but I think that you know your talk was slotted for an hour. You said two. No, it was an hour talk and then an hour discussion, but we kind of mixed everything in, so you've got until two. Okay. Or one. One. Yeah. You, you've been up for fifteen minutes. So any? any uh, Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Well, he extricates himself from the row and, there. And did Andrea show up yet? No. Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. So I got two pieces of advice a bit later than I wish I had gotten them. The uh, first one was no free speech until financial independence. And the second one was... Um, I, read a script writer in Hollywood who um, reviews scripts for a living. And when he walks out of a movie with a friend, and the friend says, hey, what do you think of the script? His answer is, I don't work on spec. Mm -hmm. What do you think of these? Everybody's got to get paid. Like, it, it's doing things for the money. Um, yeah, it, it's if somebody's paying you to do it, do it, you know. By day, I, I do penetration testing, you know, IoT stuff. But this other stuff, like I said, something that you just face plant in, you don't even try, and it, it pops up in, your, in front of your face. Um, a lot of you in this room are probably familiar with the thing. If you, you'll walk into a room, and you'll see something that 100 people have walked past that's wrong. Like you, You'll see a lock that's undone or, or some other problem. This is that thing in my head that I can't let go. I, I see a problem. I want to understand the problem. I want to fix the problem. Yeah, I could be uh, offering my services or, or, or you know, making myself uh, for hire to these companies, but then you're suddenly getting into weird uh, issues with, uh, uh, you know, at what point is it blackmail or, or uh, extortion? If you say, well, I could help you fix this, you know, um, do you think that there may have been a way for you to somehow make the government of Alberta cognizant of their issues and get paid that you didn't take advantage of? Like uh, maybe going. To I became a calls? political hot potato that a, the, the, the whole team they were running to fix this stuff, I would have been wonderful uh, uh, handling them and working with them. But yeah, it's that whole thing of politically, there is no way this guy like – you know, was the problem. We got him fired. Could you ever trust him? So it's one of those things. I, I don't worry about the money. I worry about the lives because a life is worth nothing and everything. It's so I was just curious because, uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your story, like in depth and very personal. Thank you. That was, that was really good. Um, so I'm curious, I mean, with so many of us who are obviously concerned about different aspects of this, is there not something out there that's like a, what I might characterize as a safe harbor as a service? And if not, like even on an international level, could we, are, I mean, we're, we're the ones who are interested, we're the, we're the, the folks who are talking to each other, we're this, we, we have the knowledge, we have the desire, we have the impetus. Can we not get that going? There's... Uh, it. The thing I heard about uh, was a uh, uh, exploits in escrow or something like that. It was, it was the idea that you, a third party, you know, handles the anonymous intake of, of a report, passes it off, and there's enough layers of obfuscation and, and legal that they can't figure out who. Problem is when you report something that it's like only you would have noticed, it would have known because you know that's your job or, or whatever. Where it's like, you know, you're the only one that's ever connected to that, you know, your IP address is in its logs. That all that obfuscation and, and, and uh, uh, anonymity goes out the window. You know, it, you can't, it, it still would help if there was like, you know, 
legal representation and, and, and such. Like, I honestly think that some of the best value you could get out of like US CERT or CCIRC or something like that is to just take a class of interns doing computer security uh, uh, training, sit them down with a Shodan account and a phone and just have them make courtesy calls. If somebody phones up and says, hey, I'm with you know a government agency. You've got an insecure thing here. You might want to fix that. You are going to get so much action and and positive you know things being fixed from that. Because the thing is, these agencies are are, are sitting there <laughs> nagging these companies. You know, fix your shit, fix your shit, patch your shit. But until somebody actually points out, hey, you haven't actually patched that. You know, you mm. you have to point to them and tell them what to patch. And then when you point to one thing, you see another and another and another. And then the scale of the, th the problem uh, becomes apparent. And then the company is like, okay, maybe we actually need to get our shit together. Um, that, for me, I, you would need a hell of a, a group to share uh, enough vulnerabilities and, and direct things. I mean, you could do it as sort of like a mixed master kind of thing where it's like all the vulnerabilities in, they all go out, nobody takes the same path twice kind of thing. But just getting the information out there. Yeah. Cool. Um, first of all, I wanted to say like your experience is of what happened to you is like so interesting because thankfully sort of ended in a good note, I'm making air quotes in here, um, because retaliation is real. And I'll, I'll do like a short story. Uh, eight years ago, I'm from Venezuela. Eight years ago, I did a, uh, I had noticed some patterns on social media from the Venezuelan government getting help from other governments and Twitter and Facebook and Wikipedia and stuff for the 2012 elections. And I ran a study and I presented this on a conf in DC in 2012. And the moment I got back, shit hit the fan. And I started getting threatening phone calls and uh, my car busted into, my passport was having issues and I had to like GTF out of there. You know, thankfully I'm now here in America, but like retaliation is real. And thankfully in Canada that did not happen to you. Um, so like, I guess maybe part of the question or a question would be, are there any laws or anything that says, cause you were essentially pointing cracks in the dam, you know, like, hey, there are cracks on this dam or on the foundation of this school, like, this could fall down and topple over. And like, if, if the, the on, example I use is, is the emperor has no clothes, you know, yeah, uh, he's, the you know, emperor's pride is so great that he, he, you know, doesn't want to be thought a fool. So he claims to see this, you know, magnificent uh, uh, fabric mm. that, yeah, doesn't exist, um, goes strutting around in these new wonderful clothes. Everyone's like, oh, these, these clothes are wonderful. Oh, oh yeah, everything's fine. Everything's secure. Little kid goes, I can see your doodle. <laughs> and then the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the story, he walks back to the palace in shame, realizing he got duped and, you know, he's going to have to, to deal with that. He doesn't shoot the kid. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's yeah. effectively how it felt to me was, was that in the real world, they shoot the kid and then everybody else is like, oh, I see nothing. Yeah. You know, just, and that needs to stop. We need to have uh, when a company does something egregiously bad, not like so incredibly stupid mm -hmm. and like forgets the basics, forgets human decency of like, you know, don't post your, your PII publicly. Put a password on your uh, Amazon bucket. Like, <laughs> God damn that. Every week there's another one. Yeah. Like something should just be like, okay, that's like fish to the head level. Like we're going to take you out in the public pillory and just like start making up uh, uh, your, your fine is going to be partially the uh, sales from all the rotten vegetables to the townsfolk. Kind of yeah. <laughs> it's so. crazy. Thank you. All right. Oh, one more. Just about good here. But yeah. When does anonymous uh, drops actually said it come into place? When 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 is it ethical to bring in anonymous uh, discussions like that? Uh, if you think that there's not a way it would necessarily be traced back to you directly, because sometimes, like I said, there's things that it's like blatantly obvious who 
because you tried to report it before and you hit a wall. But if they go back and look, you say, oh, well, I tried to report it before. It must be him. Um, if there's enough abstraction, you know, like there's been stuff I found just very tangentially from uh, other work I was doing that it's like, like I said, the courtesy call. I tried. I reported. Here's I sent an email. I, I made a phone call. I tried. Um, how much you have to follow up depends on the issue. You know, some of it could be really minor stuff like, hey, you, you know, your webcam or, or whatever is publicly facing. It's, you know, looking at the, the lunchroom in the office, but I can see like corporate logo on the, the wall or something like that and know where it is. Be like, hey, uh, your employees might not like that. Just saying, but you don't necessarily need to follow up or anything. Um, doing so anonymously is fine, uh, but oftentimes they won't take that seriously. It'll get filtered. It's you know, so again, having done this a lot, having a reputation, having uh, a reliability of it, of actually like reporting something and not publicly disclosing it until it's fixed, meant that people were willing to listen. You know, they weren't just willing to dismiss or, you know, at worst, call lawyers. Yeah. Back. Would you advise using uh, strong anonymity protections from the very beginning of the research process and then making the hard decision about whether to disclose your identity? Strong right? anonymity protections. Like instead of doing security research with your IP, use Tor just whenever you do anything as a matter of practice so that you don't have that incident if you're the only IP that votes something. Yeah, so he's talking about obfuscation. Well, so much of the stuff that I, I find, um, I never intended to. Like, I wasn't, like, part of a project or anything like that for, for work or whatever. It was the, huh, I wonder. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. That, that's not the IP space I was looking at, but what's this? Oh, shit. Now, you know, great. Now I got another one. One more? One minute. Okay, one, one minute. minute. All right. Anybody yeah. have anything for Renderman? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.